And here we are coming to I Survived Vacation. I'm still alive after vacation. This is Pastor Mike and I am online and I am still alive even after going on vacation. Uh, I appreciate your patience and your forbearance with me while I went and had a little fun with my wife and my, and my boys. And uh, we did. We had a, we had a good time. Uh, we were glad to come back. We were tired, but we're glad to be here and glad to be here. I, my computer shut off again, naturally. This thing runs all morning, never has a problem. Get ready to start broadcasting. Yeah, poof, there it goes. But we are live, and we're going to keep going today like ain't nothing wrong. Uh, we are broadcasting to you live. You can pick us up at pastormikeonline.com. You can get us at visitbethelchurch.com or propheticresearchministries.com or wherever else you want to .com yourself. Sermonaudio.com, and they are listening in live today, 91.3 Watchman FM in Samburu, Kenya. And you good folks in Kenya, be thankful that your government doesn't have enough money to afford its own spy network. Of course, I, ha I have a feeling that the United States is doing that for you. That's what I, I just, just, just kind of a feeling there. You are being watched whether you want to be or not. It just seems like we don't have a choice in the matter. Um, here is an article that came across my, actually, I think this was on Drudge Report. Uh, by the way, Drudge Report is, and all the news outlets are reporting right now, uh, there's a couple things, very serious things going on. One of them in the United States of America, they're talking about immigration control uh, in this country. And I am 100% I am for immigrants. I, am, I, I attended my first uh, immigration or uh, citizenship ceremony on May 30th. May 30th, my son-in-law, Michael, from Nairobi, Kenya, petitioned and became a United States citizen on May 30th. And I was there at his uh, swearing-in, and when he was given his... Uh, he, he now has the right to vote, to be an American citizen, to have enjoy all the freedoms and the liberties that you and I enjoy as American citizens. And so I am for that. And there was a large group of people there that were getting citizenship. And you know, the funny thing was, not one of them was an American. <laughs> I don't know why it's strange that way. It just, just kind of works out that way. But anyway, there was, I don't know, probably 70 some odd people there that were getting citizenship. And I am 100% for it. You want to come to this country? You want to contribute to uh, you want to contribute to America, you want to contribute to what's going on here, you want to be part of the economy of America, I am all for that 100%. You want to come in and break the rules, I'm not for it. We are supposed to be a nation of laws and rules, and those rules are, if you want to come into this country, we will invite you with open arms, but you got to follow the rules. You have to be, you have to be, you have to check in. You have to fill out forms and documents and be here legally if you want to come into this country. Joseph Biden, the president in charge of vice in the White House, actually makes the, makes the case that we don't need to stop illegal immigrants from coming into our nation. We need to actually thrust forward. There needs to be more coming in because that helps our economy. And I'm just going... What? What helps our economy? I don't understand this. They come in, they get free schooling, they get free medical care, they're being given in certain states, or, or they are thinking about giving them driver's licenses. They come and they work and they earn money. They do everything but pay taxes, because if they, if they pay taxes, then that will reveal that they're not United citizens or they are not here legally on a, with a green card or a visa or anything like that. So they don't pay taxes. They just take and take and take. And the president in charge of vice in our country says, oh, that's a good idea. 
And I, I think that history, but not only history, the scriptures reveal this is not going to turn out well for what we hold sacred and hold true in this country, the United States of America. It hasn't turned out for any other nation in the world, and it's not going to work out for us. Again, you want to come to this country, you want to be who you are, you want to bring your food, you want to bring your ideas, you want to bring your philosophies in, you're welcome to it. Do it legally. That's one of the things going on. And the other thing that's going on is the failed, um, and I'm not a political expert, I'm not a man about town on international affairs, but I have the firm opinion that the, the um, international policies of the Obama administration in this nation has been proven over and over to be an absolute failure. And people should have recognized this the moment that he became president when he goes on the I'm sorry we're America tour, bowing down to all the leaders of the world, bowing down and kissing them and, and, um, and humiliating himself in front of them instead of saying, hi, we're from America. He goes around bowing to them. And so now what's going on in Baghdad is exactly what we did not want Maybe, maybe, maybe some people did. I don't know. But right now in Iraq, one city after another is falling to guess who? Islamists, militants, people carrying around a, um, a star and crescent symbol, people who are taking over the world one city at a time for Allah. And Allah is not the same God that you and I worship. Can I get an amen out of somebody? It's not the same God. I don't care what Obama says. I don't care what um, uh, George Bush says. I don't care what Billy Graham says. I don't care what the leaders of the denominations are trying to tell you. I don't care what Rick Warren says. Allah is not the same God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the same one. And they, are, they have proven themselves, the Islamists, the militants. Um, and, and I'll say this. We were in Orlando, Florida. And, um, I mean, I'm from the Midwest, and I've got Midwestern values, and, and we're sort of in the middle of the country, so we're secluded from a lot of things. We don't see a lot of things that, going on, that go on in the rest of the world, especially on the coasts of America. And I just noticed being in Orlando for over a week, there's a lot of people in Orlando that talk funny. They don't speak in the English. And there are a lot of Muslims either living in Orlando or Orlando or just visiting Orlando. There's a ton of them there. We had two uh, we we rode on a plane and both of our stops were in Detroit. And I went to, I can't remember what desk it was, at the Detroit airport. And there was a woman there wearing a, wearing a burqa, wearing the head covering. And I'm looking at her, and I'm going, you don't look Arabic. Maybe I'm just, I don't know, maybe I just, but you don't look Arabic. But she had the burqa on nonetheless. When I got up to her and was talking to her, she spoke to me in American English, no accent whatsoever, none. She was from Detroit, um, or as some of the people call it up there, Dearbornistan, because in Dearborn, Michigan, one of the outlying areas of Detroit, the Islamists have pretty much taken over that whole town. They did it on purpose, by the way, and they are going to force Sharia law into that area if they haven't done it already, and you can see the inroads of Islamic Sharia law being made in the United States of America. In the, but here's this young lady, and she is not Arabic. She's not from the Middle East. She doesn't have an accent. She doesn't have the look. She doesn't have the olive-colored skin. She doesn't have anything like that. She was born in America, and she looks like she was a young lady wearing a burqa, which means that she was she had probably married a Muslim, 
or she just decided, you know what, being chained to a couch with 71 other women, that sounds like a lot of fun for me, which is the Islamic version of heaven or paradise. I don't understand what draws women into Islam. I don't get it. Because if you're a woman, number one, you're a piece of property. And Sharia law and Islamic law is all about your husband beating on you until you submit to him. And possibly him having the right to kill you in the streets for doing something like talking on a cell phone. Then, if you happen to survive that, and you are going to be in paradise in, under Islamic law, under the Islamic scriptures, then your lot for all of eternity is to be chained to a couch and have an Islamic man sleep with you repeatedly over and over and over and over again. That's what, that's what Allah promises you women. I just, I, it just threw me. I don't get it. But the Islamists are taking over the nation of Iraq. That ideology, that militant, we hate America ideology, is taking over in a place where we had established bases all over that country when we put down Saddam Hussein, we built military bases here, there, and everywhere. Now we have a, a central place in the Middle East where we can launch if we have to. And the Islamists are taking over. And my question is, what are we doing about it? And they are taking over. They take over every nation that they can get their hands on. They're working on Kenya right now. I saw that when I was there. They're coming uh, from the north out of Somalia. And they're just moving their way in. And these, I've been around some of these Islamic men in Kenya. Very arrogant, very cocky, very hateful people. They're not nice to us non-Islam or non-Muslim people. But anyway, this article that I got from El Drudge Reporto, Google buys Skybox Satellite Company to become, and this is what the article says, to become the all-seeing eye in the sky. Now, I did a video, what was it, a couple of years ago, called The All-Seeing Eye, Surveillance Society, and the New World Order. And I have this theory. Let's do this. Let's get out our can, our fresh can of King James, and let's open it up to Isaiah chapter 14. Let's find out what's, what's going on here. I'll read this article. You turn to Isaiah 14. I'll read the article. Uh, it says, Google has purchased satellite startup Skybox Imaging in its quest to extend their all-seeing eye into every aspect of our lives. Now, there's something you need to understand. Google makes it look like that they are trying to help us in our fight against government surveillance, surveillance of all of our emails, of uh, all of our, uh, our Google searches, of all of our phone calls and text messages and everything. They're, Google's trying to make it look like they're buddies to us, that we're your fr we are, in fact, your big brother that's going to watch out for you. Just remember that every year, I would say probably for the past at least five years that I know of, Google representatives have been going to the Bilderberg meeting. Why? Because of the agenda of the Bilderberg meeting. And Google goes, and some of the high-ranking leaders of this country goes, and other countries they all show up there. They meet in secret. Nobody can know what it, what's being talked about there. But if you, uh, and I did a video on this one too, Bilderberg, the, the true story. And all you need to do is know these different people from these different corporations, from these different things that are showing up there. The Bible reveals to you what the agenda is. And so here is Google now buying a satellite company. Google has billions and billions of dollars at their hands. And how did they get that money? Because you don't pay money to do a Google search. 
but somebody else does when you do a Google search, and that is advertisers. And Google is on the front line, the cutting edge of the technology of knowing precisely what you personally want in life. They know everything that is technologically, how can I say that, technologically knowable about you, and they're, they're looking for, they're always looking for new ways to increase their knowledge about you. What are they using this knowledge for? What are they doing this for? Um, and we'll look at the scriptures here in a little bit. I have a theory. The article says, on the surface, Google says that they plan on using the new technology as a way to keep their Google Maps up to date. Yeah. But those who are aware of their military-industrial complex ties think otherwise. Over the past few years, Google has quietly entered into a relationship with the Pentagon and DARPA, defense, uh, something defense projects. Can't remember what it, what, it, what it means. Anyway, to become one of their biggest contract suppliers of technology and information. Google acquired robot maker Boston Dynamics last year and is fully invested in creating battlefield cyborgs. Those are robots, by the way, to supply to the government. Now, again, and there's an article that I'm going to read here that goes along with this, something that Ray Kurzweil said just recently, that um, every movie that I've ever seen in my life about robots learning how to do warfare, never turns out good for the pesky little human carbon-based life forms that are on this planet. It never turns out good. Think Skynet. Think of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Think of I'll Be Back. Think of the Terminator. Think of um, iRobot. Think, think all of these things. All of the fantasy and sci-fi writers... When they started introducing the idea that robots were going to be as smart as humans, it never works out for the humans. Never does. Think about war being perpetuated now. And, and I want you to think about this. What is it that causes an army that's involved in a war, what is it that causes that army to either retreat, surrender, um, or say, you know what, we give up, we're done, we, we're going to lose the war. What is it that causes that to happen? It's the defeat of its soldiers. If its soldiers are being massacred on the battlefield and it's, and it's just costing more and more and more human lives of soldiers, then that particular army says, we can't do this anymore. We, we're giving up. We can't fight you anymore. We're retreating. We're going to change that. We're going to put soldiers on the battlefield now that are not human. They're just machines. They're pieces of property. They're manufactured in a factory somewhere. And if we lose this one, we'll manufacture more and we'll put them out there. So what would be the interest in any one giving army who has robot soldiers on the battlefield? Would they ever stop fighting as long as they had the ability to keep making the robots. Would they ever give up? Would they ever surrender? Would they ever quit? Things like this are only going to perpetuate war and make them worse. They're not going to make them better. And there is now in today's world, and never has been, there is no such thing as a war where only the soldiers get killed. That doesn't exist. I love my country, but the United States of America is probably one of the world's worst at killing civilians in the name of the war on terrorists. I don't, I don't think we're doing a good job here. But anyway, the article talking about battlefield cyborgs to supply to the government. They also spent $3.2 billion dollars to get Nest, a company that makes a smart thermostat and can also track your every movement inside your home. You remember now, in a lot of places in America, there is a robot watching you go to the Cho that is 
the word cho is Swahili for toilet, commode, potty, bathroom, outhouse, the john, the loo. There is a computer. There is a robot that is watching you go to the bathroom. Why? Because some people don't flush the toilet when they go. And I've been in places in Kenya where that's really not a problem, flushing the toilet. There's nothing, there's no handle. There's no, there's no handle hovering over the hole in the ground. So it's not a problem. They don't flush out there. But that's what they're doing. Robots know when you're done. And when you're done, they flush the toilet for you. And we get so used to that, we think, we don't think anything of it. And these robots are watching us use the bathroom. Now we're going to put them in our houses. They're going to watch us do everything. Track your every movement. These are only but a few of the recent purchases that Google has made. When started out, what started out as a totally geeked out company who created a really cool search engine has become a fully mature, cold as ice, and all invasive surveillance organization locked in with the Pentagon and monitoring our every move. When fully operational, Google's new Skybox satellites will provide the NSA with high resolution, full color pictures and video of everywhere we go and everything we do. Why? Isaiah 14, you want to believe in conspiracies? I believe you ought to believe in conspiracy fact and not conspiracy theory. Oh, I, I you know, believe I got a few theories out there. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I usually don't like to talk about them until... I can see them in the Scripture. Then you see them in the Scripture, then they're conspiracy fact. And then I can say, here, this is thus saith the Lord. And in Isaiah chapter 14, I want you to think about it. Here is Lucifer, how it are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. But if you're, now if you're, if you're listening to me and you're reading along in your Bible and it says morning star or day star, then uh, throw that Bible away and get a can of King James and open it up. Because your Bible, your old can of Bible is spoiled. It's corrupt. It's, just smell it. My wife does that to me every time. She'll pull something out of the refrigerator. And she'll open it up. And she'll go, Ugh! Here, taste this and see if it's bad. I'm not tasting that. You done, I've seen your expression. I'm not touching it. But if your Bible in verse 12 of Isaiah 14 says, Morning star or day star... You have a nasty, corrupted, stinky Bible. You need to throw it out and get you an incorruptible word of God, which is the King James Bible. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Think about that. You have to ask the question, has the devil weakened the United States of America? When from 1620... Up through the 1700s, you had the formation of America was basically people who wanted to come here to have a safe place to believe the Bible and what it said and to preach it and then to evangelize by sending missionaries into the various native tribes, then sending missionaries to Africa, to the Orient, to um, uh, even... God forbid Australia sending missionaries to every place in the world trying to teach people the gospel. That was the beginning of this nation. Has the devil weakened this nation? Absolutely. How is he doing it? He's doing it not from, not from the Russians, not from the Chinese, not from the Islamists that are trying to invade our nation. He's doing it through the Americans. He's weakening us as a people morally. And God refuses to bless a nation who turns out as bad or worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. 
We declare our sin as Sodom. We hide it not. Is what America is what's going on in this nation right now. When we were in Orlando, we were at um, we took taking the boys to Universal Studios. They've got two theme parks. One I kind of recommend. Well, the other one I don't. The other one's got Harry Potter stuff in it, and it's stupid. Uh, but anyway. Um, we're standing there in line at Universal Studios theme park, and there's an airplane flying around with one of those big banners coming out of the back of it. And I said, Lisa, look at that. And she was looking at it. I said, what does that say? And we were both looking at it, and it finally got close enough where we could read it. It said, warning, gay day at Disney is, I think it was supposed to be like June 6th or June 7th, something like that. And I remembered that Disney World, does this every year. They promote, they'll even give online discount packages to sodomites from all over the all over the world can come to Walt Disney World on that particular day and hug and squeeze and kiss all they want to and nobody's going to say a word about it. That's the kind of immorality that's going on in this nation. And I I've I've made several comments on Facebook recent while I was on vacation. I'm thinking about all this, and I'm saying, you know what? In America, tick-tock, tick-tock, the clock is running. There's going to come a time when I will, I will be, it will be illegal for me to speak out against the sin of sodomy. It will be against the law for me to do that. And not if, but when I do that, they will come, they will arrest me, they will have a trial, they will, um, they will probably seize our, our building and our assets, they will probably try to shut us down in every way in the world. But I'm going to say it, no matter what. He's weakening this nation right now. And then he says, uh, for thou hast said in thine heart, number one, I will ascend into heaven. Number two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Number three, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. What is the congregation? It's God's people. Do you think, do you think that the devil wants to rule your home, which is a gathering of God's people? Do you think the devil wants to rule over your home? Absolutely. By the way, I'm going to I'm going to announce this now. I'm I'm working on the outline and the script and um I've just about got it ready. I'm going to do a video video teaching called Home Church and Evangelism. And um for those of you who were told by some preacher or some jealous pompous church people that because you can't go to their church anymore because they're preaching out of the NIV and they don't believe the Word of God, they don't believe the Bible's the Word of God, and they're starting to bring in all this stuff. For those of you who said, we're not going to be a part of that. We're not going to sit in the congregation of evildoers. We will not do it. You were told by, by a preacher or by some pompous church member well, the Bible says you have to go to church or you can't go to heaven. That's what the Bible says. If you ever get told that, number one, ask them, show me that in the Bible. Show me where I have to go to your church building so I can be right with God. That falls under the same category as these people. These Seventh-day people who say, God said you had to go to church on Saturday. God said so. And because you don't go to church on Saturday, you're not really saved. You're not going to go to heaven because you have the mark of the beast on you because you go worship on Sunday. That's the day of the sun. You worship the sun. Really? I guess that means you Saturday worshipers worship Saturn. But that's the same idea. They'll tell you what they, what they want you to think. They will, they will bring condemnation to you when, in fact, there really is no condemnation to you. Does the Bible say that you have to go to a church building? The answer is no. 
Now it does say not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. So let me ask you a question. When you and your husband or you and your wife and your family decided to home church, did you just go off on Sunday to a separate room in the house and shut the door and stay away from each other? Well, I'm going to go in my room and have church. Well, I'm going to go in my room and have church. No, you gathered together. You assembled together as a family, and you, you had church in your home. Lisa and I and the boys did this Sunday morning. We were in Orlando. We don't know where to go to church. We probably, probably wouldn't have been able to find a decent one there. So we had church in the room that we were staying in. We gathered. I read scriptures. We talked about it. We prayed. And then later on the day, we're listening to Reg Kelly talk about biblical separation. And I'm just going, man, that was a good message. Boy, I really needed that. But I'm going to make a video teaching from the scriptures alone that shows you, number one, why you should, in some cases, you should home church. Not in every case. I know, and I know I'm kind of chasing a rabbit here, but that's all right. I went a week and a half without chasing any rabbits. Some of you, and I love you. I love you. I do. I I, I care about you. I, I want you to know the truth. I want you to be established in the present truth. I want that for you, and I want that for your life. Some of you don't go to church simply because you're too rebellious in your nature. You've decided that if the preacher doesn't speak the little phrases that you want him to say, that he's a bad preacher. He's a he's probably 501c3. That's his problem right there. He's, he's under the, the IRS. The IRS is telling him what to do, and I won't have any part of it. Some of you have just made up in your mind what it's going to take to satisfy you, and you know for a fact that there aren't probably any preachers in the world they are going to tell you exactly what you want to hear, so you've just decided, well, I ain't going to go to no church. I don't have to go to church. Churches are evil. That's not even in the Bible. Pastors are evil. That's, it's, that, that guy gets paid. He shouldn't even get paid. Some of you had invented stuff in your mind. And the reason why you don't go to a church somewhere is not because there's not a good one around. It's just that you're so rebellious in your nature that you just, you just, you're not going to be under anybody's authority. And I'm telling you, God put bishops in this world as pastors to bring protection to you and to your family. That's what the Scripture teaches. God said, I will give you pastors. I'll give you watchmen. I'll give you pastors that will teach you the truth. There's one guy on YouTube, hates my guts. I mean, he hates my guts. And I heard him, say, heard him make a statement one time. He said, uh, yeah, I used to think Hoggard was good. I used to think some of these other preachers were good. But I'm telling you, there's no, there's no good preachers out there anymore. They're all, they're all gone. There's no good preachers out there anymore. And I went, that's unbiblical. That is in total contradiction to what God said and God promised. But that's what you've decided. You've decided that there are no such things as good churches anymore. So you just won't go anywhere, and you just do your own thing. And that also is unbiblical. And by the way, and then I will say this. In your defense, if that is you and you are you have a rebellious nature and you know that there isn't going to be a preacher in the world that's going to satisfy your lust, then I think you are doing the right thing by staying out of churches because you'll do nothing but cause a lot of trouble. But there are families out there. There are people out there. You love the Lord. You love the Bible. You would give your right arm if you could find a good Bible-believing, fellowshipping church, even if you didn't agree to everything that they said. I, the people at Bethel Church don't agree with me on everything either. One says this, the other says that, but we all know that this is the Word of God and just love each other and move on. It's like a family. It's like a marriage. And you're out there, and um, I've, I'm putting together the notes and the ideas and the scriptures behind home church and evangelism. And I believe in both of them. And uh, so that would be coming out. But he wants to rule over the congregation. 
So is he ruling over churches? Absolutely. Totally. In many cases, in some cases, whole denominations. He's ruling over them. But anyway, let me get down to the nitty-gritty here. Um, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. There it is. There's your conspiracy, right? We need conspiracy music here. Um, there we go. He said, I will be like the Most High, which means I want to have the ability to see everything that's going on. But he's a created being, not the creator. And he doesn't have that power by himself. So he is working on a network a conglomeration, uh, a good movie, Eagle Eye. Eagle Eye is all about that. It's all about a computer that sees everything that's going on in the country. Person of interest, a TV show, same thing. A computer that monitors everything that goes on in the world. And by the way, the, the progression of the series, uh, the person of interest, they've now built two computers two computer systems that can monitor everything that's going on in the country. And one of the characters has referred to them as gods, and these gods are fighting one another. One of them is a benevolent god. One is malevolent god. And they're fighting one another. They're smart. They, have, they can think like humans. Ray Kurzweil, you might remember him. He was on the front of Time magazine saying 2045, the year that humans will become immortal. Ray Kurzweil is a futurist. Uh, he is also an inventor, very innovative. Uh, he's got a keen mind. I play, if you look up uh, the stage of Bethel Church during our worship services, I'm up there playing a Kurzweil piano. He designed it. It feels, it's, it's got an amazing feel to it, and it's got a good sound to it. He came up with that. But Ray Kurzweil is saying now, in less than two decades, you won't just use your computers. You'll have relationships with them. There's some people already do. Because of artificial intelligence, computers will be able to read at human levels by 2029 and will also begin to have different human characteristics, said Ray Kurzweil, director of engineering at Google. Wow. And Google hired him specifically because of the way he thinks. And Ray Kurzweil is saying they're going to think like humans and we're going to be immortal by 2045. Do you think Ray Kurzweil is against that? No way. He's for it all the way. He wants this to happen. He is using his imagination, the very thing that God said, cast that down. He is using his imagination to develop ideas for the technicians and the biologists and the computer specialists and the, and the phone people to make and manufacture, to make them become reality. This was precisely what God was getting at in Genesis chapter 11. He said that's good. If, if they all are sprechen the same uh, Espanol, then what's going to happen is whatever they imagine, they're going to be able to do it. And it's not a good thing to have these imaginations because nine times out of ten, you know as well as I do that our imaginations are so wicked that they are, in fact, against the work and the will of, of the Most High God. You and I, we, we know how to dream up all kinds of stuff, don't we? Ray Kurzweil is one of them. He's very well paid. He's very well respected. Uh, Kurzweil says, when I say about human uh, levels, I'm talking about emotional intelligence. The ability to tell a joke, to be funny, to be romantic, to be loving, to be sexy. To, that is the cutting edge of human intelligence. That is not a sideshow, Kurzweil said. The Oscar-winning movie, Her, which was about a man who fell in love with his operating system, foreshadowed many of Kurzweil's predictions about how artificial intelligence will evolve. By the way, there's a movie coming out this summer called Lucy. It's about a woman who she's, I don't know, she's carrying a package uh, on an airplane. They put the package on the inside of her. It leaks. It spills out some kind of goo. And now all of a sudden she's becoming a god s 
because she has the ability to use all of her brain. Lucy is short for Lucifer, light bearer. Um, the personalities of computers operating systems will be customizable for each user, he said, much like how the operating system in the movie Her was portrayed. I have not seen this movie. I need to make a note. Computers will also provide a way for humans to expand the range of their brains via the cloud, Kurzweil said. In the future, people will be able to directly connect their brain to the cloud so that they can expand their knowledge and memory. You know what that is, don't you? Cloud computing is the end thing, man. It's where everybody is. I'll be honest with you. I am using cloud technology right now. When we record anything that we do, in this church, we record to a cloud service uh, folder. I am recording Pastor Mike online right now to a cloud service folder that syncs, synchronizes with other computers. In this, in this group, Jazz has a link to it. She can go. What she does is after I'm done and it's uploaded, she then pulls it and puts it on whatever she does with it. Um, when we record church services, those go in the cloud and they're automatically synchronized with Lindsay's computer. Lindsay comes in on Monday and starts posting everything to Sermon Audio. That's just how it works. And I, can, I agree, I can see that taking over right now. We are dumping humanity in favor of other things. Here's an article, Quebec approves bill legalizing euthanasia on demand. The Quebec National Assembly voted today in Bill 52 that legalizes euthanasia on demand in the Canadian province. Um, euthanasia, you know what that is? That is it's mercy killing, Jack Kevorkian style. Oh, they're suffering. Let's put them out of their misery. I preached Joe Polite's funeral yesterday. One of the things, I went to visit Joe shortly before he died. He sat up on the side of the bed, nearly totally emaciated from the cancer. He shook his head. He said, I thought I'd be dead by now. I'm surprised I lived this long is what he was saying. And I, well, while I, I believe that there should be a dignity about a person's death, I do not believe for a second that it falls upon human beings to take that decision as their own. Now, I'm not talking about uh, me or somebody getting into a horrible accident where I have almost no brain function whatsoever, and I'm not going to recover, and them putting me on machines to keep my heart and lungs going. I've already told my wife, if that ever happens, don't let them do it. I know where I'm going. But I'm talking about people, and let me read this, and there's something in here that sounds pretty familiar. The Bill uh, 52 legalizes euthanasia by redefining it as a form of health care. Did you get that? Let me, uh, a form of health care. Let's see, under the term of end-of-life care. That's in the Obamacare health plan, end-of-life care. The measure passed this afternoon by a 94 to 22 margin. That means that most of the politicians representing the people of Quebec have now turned themselves over to say, I kill them. They're better off dead anyway with no abstentions. Alex Shadenberg, executive director of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, stated, let's be clear, Bill 52 gives Quebec physicians the right to intentionally and directly cause the death of persons by lethal injection. This represents an act of homicide and not an act of end-of-life care. By the way, the idea of end-of-life care is in the Obamacare law end of life care and when you hear people talking about it set up death panels and of course obama says that oh no it doesn't set up death panels he's lying through his teeth it is a known ideology amongst the elite in the world 
that they believe that they should have the right to decide who lives, who dies, who breeds. Margaret Sanger, the, the queen of abortion, the founder of Planned Parenthood, Hillary Clinton receives the Margaret Sanger Award and praises Margaret Sanger. I just love Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger is my favorite person. I modeled my life after Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger, you ought to read some of the stuff that she wrote. She hated black people. She hated Hispanic people. She hated the brown people, yellow people, red people. She hated them. She, her idea was that they bred too much. They had too many babies. They could never have the brain function to be able to live high on the hog like us white people do. So let's kill their babies before they're born. That was what she wanted. If I were, if I were you and I were black, yellow, red, whatever, I would be offended at anybody in our country who aligns themselves with Margaret Sanger. It's tantamount to aligning yourself with Adolf Hitler. Hitler wanted a master race. That means kill all the other races. Or hang on to a few of them because we could use them to mow our grass. Sound familiar? Why does the president in charge of vice in this country want all of these illegal immigrants to come into our country when, in fact, underneath his, his rhetoric, he hates their guts because somebody needs to mow his grass, and he ain't doing it. I've heard these politicians say, well, these guys are just coming in and doing work that Americans don't do anymore. What is wrong with us mowing our own grass? What is wrong with us cleaning our own windshields? What is wrong with us doing th working at McDonald's for minimum wage? What is wrong with that? They're going to legalize euthanasia in Quebec under the guise of end-of-life care, and you watch and see it's going to happen in the United States of America under the Obama health care plan. You're, uh, boy, I hate to bring her into the discussion, but I have been, uh, I've been tweeting about Sister Waymire. Sister Waymire is um, she's very, very special to us here at Bethel Church. You've heard me talk about her. You may have seen her on camera. She's not been able to come to church for a while. She's 95, going on 96 years old. Um, we got a call yesterday before Joe's funeral that she was in bad shape. She was in the local hospital. I went to see her yesterday after the funeral. And um, She's not doing well. Her heart just is not going to live much longer. And we're going to miss her. She was a charter member of Bethel Church. Her husband, her and her husband donated the land that I'm sitting on right now for building this building. Her husband was a man that I highly respected. I feared him too because every time I ran through this church, there was James Waymar standing there. You better stop it. Boy, I was scared of him as I was a bear. But Sister Waymar was always just that godly presence here in our church, and we are close to losing her. Under Obamacare, they would have thrown her under the bus a long time ago. And if you think it won't happen, Joe Polite's youngest son, Jared. They discovered he had autism. Joe and Dee, Dee especially, believed that it had everything to do with um, some of the inoculations that he was given as a baby. I can't argue with her on it. I think there's, I think there's a real connection that connects autism with some of the injections that children get. Can't prove it. I can't disagree with it. Under Obamacare, it's, it's, not, it's not a far-fetched idea to conceive that since Jared has autism, 
And he cannot function alone. He cannot do his own work. He cannot work in a factory. He cannot dig a ditch. He's going to be a, they would turn him a useless eater all the days of his life. We probably should go ahead and end his life and thus end his suffering. Joe and Dee have given their life for this young man. Brother Charlie Jameson, dear friend of mine, him and sister Naomi, when, when they were told that their little boy had Down syndrome, probably wouldn't live very long. I'm sure if I remember right, I may not be telling the whole thing. I don't remember, but it seemed like to me she was told, maybe you should have an abortion to save his suffering. Their little boy now is in his teens, early teens. Charlie and Naomi have raised him in such a way that he can sit all day long in a preaching conference and behave. It's amazing. Anybody that's ever had a special needs child would tell you, why would you want to kill this? This has been one of the greatest things ever happened in my life. These children, they, they don't know a whole lot of anything, but they know who loves them. What a world we live in. I don't know too much about, what time is it? I don't know too much about this particular story. This, you know, when you, when you travel, you don't get to hear and read a lot of news. And apparently, there was a shooting by some people um, in Las Vegas. Let me read the story here. The mainstream media is officially having a full-on field day with the Vegas shooter's online postings demonizing the Patriot movement and basically anyone critical of the government. In case you haven't seen the news, the main report is that 31-year-old Jared Miller and his 22-year-old wife, Amanda, shot two police in cold blood at Las Vegas CeCe's Pizza. It left a Gadsden uh, don't tread on me flag on one cop's body and a Nazi swastika on the others before heading over to the Walmart across the street and yelling about how the revolution had begun. If it sounds really stupid, that's because it is. Today's reports are highlighting with fervent glee every single detail of the Miller's anti-government, pro-liberty movement beliefs as per their Facebook post and YouTube likes. Um, apparently, this was a couple that, and the government wants to characterize people like us as being like people like them, but I guarantee you there's nothing about me that's like them. I guarantee you. You know why? Because I actually believe in authority. I believe in, in God ordaining people of this world to rule over other people in this world. And I believe the Scripture teaches it. And again, some of you out there are just rebellious to the core. No man rules over me. And I can tell you, not even God does in some of your cases. Am I being mean? Yeah, a little bit. I sure am. God gave us people to rule over us. Do they do that the right way all the time? No. But to just shoot two police officers in cold blood, did God tell them to do that? Absolutely not. Does God want us to fight for and, and retake this country? And I don't know that that's how it's going to turn out. I don't know that that's what God wants. Now, some people have accused me because I actually preached Romans 13 the way it's written instead of the way that some people want you to believe it. And I've, I've preached that, and I got, I mean, I got blasted by people who were accusing me of being one of these um, preacher hacks that FEMA has hired, that when it all hits the fan, I'm going to tell all the listeners out there, when the FEMA bus comes by, God said, get on it. That's what I've been accused of. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. FEMA doesn't have buses. What is wrong with you people? Let's see. We need a... Uh, where are they? There we go. No, I won't do that. But I will tell you that when a police officer pulls you over, ask to see your driver's license, show him your driver's license. 
when he tells you you were doing 80 in a 65 zone, I'm going to write you a ticket. Don't spit at him. Don't tear it up in front of him. Don't say, ah, down with the new world order. Go pay the ticket. You were driving too fast. Obey the laws, people. Now, if that law tells you you have to murder your unborn child, you don't have to obey that one. If that law tells you you cannot preach Jesus, you don't have to obey that one. If that law tells you that you better not say anything about sodomites, you don't obey that law. Where man's law makes you or forces you or tries to force you to break God's law, then you don't obey man's law. But if man says, pay your taxes, then you should pay your taxes. If man says, pull over, you should pull over. If man's authority tells you to do something that is lawful according to the scriptures, you're bound to do it. We don't believe in anarchy in Bible Christianity. We don't believe that I am, I am sovereign before God and no one can rule over me. That's not biblical. It's not there in the scriptures. And again, I'm not a FEMA hack. I'm not being paid by the IRS or any other government entity to tell you or try to trick you. No way, no how. But I'm just telling you, some of you need to get your Bible out and read it. Read, read a few more chapters. It won't hurt you. You might just find out that God has a better way for you to live. Boy, I'm going to get emails on that one. I just know I am. By the way, if you'd like to write in during this Pastor Mike Online live broadcast, Pastor Mike Online at gmail.com. Uh, but anyway, the Vegas shooters and I have absolutely nothing in common whatsoever. But that's how they're trying to paint us in this world right now. And you and I know it. You and I know that at some point they're going to trash the Constitution and then force everybody into, or, or maybe that's how it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen. But I will tell you that, that when it comes down to it, you and I should be like, uh, who was it, Peter and John? Who, when they were told by the Sanhedrin, we do not want you to preach in Jesus' name ever again, they said, we ought to obey God rather than man. And that's exactly what they did. They went out teaching and preaching Jesus Christ everywhere they were. Not a bad thing to do. Let's see what's on everybody's mind today. Uh, let's see here. Friend in PA says, Pastor Mike, I've been trying to expose Margaret Sanger for years. However, even when I use quotation marks and quote Sanger directly, I get a barrage of hate directed at me. They attribute her words to me, pandemic stupidity. Thank you for your tireless efforts to get us to open our eyes and pay attention. I appreciate that, friend. AJ, what's up, AJ? It's, he says, it's interesting you mentioned a movie about Lucy, considering I just saw this on Facebook feed today. Uh, let's see here. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. I don't know if I should. Should I click on that, AJ? You're not trying to infect me with a virus, are you? Uh, ooh, deep in the constellation of Centaurus lies a star 50 light years away from the Earth. This star is so unique that astronomers nicknamed it Lucy. Lucy. Wow. It's a bright star that they called Lucy fur or something like that. Lucy. Uh, AJ says, also, I've been really burdened about euthanasia, and that's why I'm so interested in going to the Nederland and Belgium to witness because they have the most liberal policies on euthanasia in the world. Uh, John from the Netherlands, if you're watching or listening to this, send me an email. Let me know exactly how they deal with this in the Netherlands. AJ, I appreciate you writing that. Uh, Dan the Man says, hi, Pastor Mike. Hi, Dan. How you doing? Um, hi, Pastor Hogger. This is from Vicki. Um, the, um, the Las Vegas couple were also at the Bundy Ranch, too, but they were asked to leave as they had radical views. I appreciate you sending that in as well. And here's a, here's a link to it. Debbie sends in, it says, rampaging couple booted from the Bundy Ranch as being too radical. They're not like us. 
Do I carry a gun? Yes, I do. I carry a gun. By the way, by the way, on our way back from Orlando, my mom calls and says, where's Lisa? Well, she's standing next to me. We're in the, what, Mom, we just got through the TSA line. And she said, oh, you guys haven't left yet? I said, no. She said, I was afraid Lisa was at Walmart. In the Festus Walmart, there was a shooting. Two thugs were trying to shake down and rob a guy in the bathroom at the Festus Walmart. And they shot him. They shot him. The bullet went through his hand. You could, you could probably guess he was doing something like that. Bullet went through his hand and into his face. Didn't kill him. Uh, he's being treated local hospital right now. They caught those two rascals. And I told my mom, I said, Mom said, boy, I was thinking about going to Walmart today. Boy, I'm glad I didn't go to Walmart. I said, Mom, they ought to be glad I didn't go to Walmart today because I carry... And if I would have been if I would have been near that thing, I don't I'm not trying to be Barney Fife, Mr. Tough Guy. There by the way, there was a here's a here's a a very valid, interesting idea about home security and um, using weapons to protect your home. A young girl, teenage girl in St. Louis in a neighborhood, going out to her car at night to get some items from her car. Two thugs walked up to her. One of them put a gun to her head and was going to usher her into her house. I wonder why they were going to do that. Hmm, I wonder what they had planned. But they ushered this girl back into her own house with a gun to her head. Her dad was visiting that night. I guess he had been divorced or something like that. Was visiting, was in the house. When those two guys walked in, he pulled his weapon. Bam! Bam! Killed the first guy. Killed him on the spot. The second guy hurt him pretty bad. He lived through it. The police, the district attorney, is charging the second robber with second-degree murder. Why? Because he was involved in a crime that resulted in the death of somebody. I like it. I like it. People, you have a right and a responsibility to protect your home, to protect your family. We have a responsibility to protect our church, and that's a responsibility that we take seriously. So anyway, it's good to hear from everybody today. I want you to get your Bible out. We're going to do some uh, we're going to do some studies in the scriptures. I actually had this pulled up and was going to talk about this uh, before we went on vacation and I got busy with everything else and we talked about everything else under the sun. I don't know if we talked about the sun, but we talked about everything else under the sun. And um, it, to me, it was, it's just a really, really good study. If you wanted to title this something, um, A Sure Foundation, maybe you can call it that. I don't know. But when it, comes to, when it comes to studying the Bible, when it comes to understanding the Scriptures, when it comes to formulating ideas uh, about, let's say, about Bible prophecy, about doctrine, Ask, and here's, and this gets me in trouble, and there's some people out there that, I mean, they really don't like me, and there, some of them say, oh, we use King James Bible. They don't like me. You know why? Because I say, you know what? Don't you think you ought to at least question the doctrines that some churches have? Don't you think that you should do that? Are we, I, I know that, I know that when we when we belong to a church, according to the book of Hebrews, uh, what is it? Hebrews thirteen is that you are to, when you are attending somebody's church, you are to submit yourself to that man's authority over you, spiritual authority, 
Now, he doesn't have the right to tell you what day to take the garbage out. He doesn't have the right to tell you what job you can have. He doesn't have the right to tell you who to marry. He doesn't have the right to tell you where to go on vacation. And I brought all those up because there are pastors out there who have ruled so harshly over their congregations that no one takes a vacation unless they ask the pastor, can we, can me and my wife go to, uh, can we go to Orlando? Are they going to be wearing short skirts in Orlando? Well, I don't know. I've never, but ah, oh, you can't go. There are pastors who will tell their people, don't you, you better not go there. You better not, you, I, you want to take a vacation? Then go to my backyard for vacation. I'm kind of making that up. But they think they have absolute dictatorial authority over everybody in their church, over every issue. And I, I don't feel, I, number one, I, I've not been given that authority over the people of Bethel. I don't think I have that authority. I don't act like I have that authority. But still and yet, as a bishop, as a pastor, God operates through realms of authority. And where there is authority, there's protection. And when you will place yourself under biblical authority, God will protect you. He'll protect your family. He'll protect your marriage. He'll protect you personally. And this is what I believe. But you ask yourself, what does my, what does my, let's say my denomination, what does my denomination teach? What does uh, the group that my church belongs to, what is it that they believe? And all I'm saying is, there's nothing wrong with asking legitimate questions about why do you believe or why does this church believe what they say they believe? Why do they do that? In fact, we are told to test the spirits to see whether they be of God. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to be in the kingdom of God. And so ask questions. Question things. Don't come across as haughty. Don't come across as a know-it-all, but say, you know, I, 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 heard, I heard something the other day, and I, I just, you know, can I ask, where is this found in Scripture? There's nothing wrong with that. It is a good foundation. A good foundation. Ask yourself the question, what is, what is my belief founded upon? What is it based upon? What is my life based upon? What is, um, in fact, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's, um, let's get out our King James Pure Bible Search software. Let's, let's see, I'm going to click this, and I'll click this, and we'll do this. We will sweep it with the besom of destruction. Let's type out F-O-U-N-D-A-T-I-O-N. And there's two forms of that, foundation or foundations. There is no foundationing or foundationingly -er in the King James Bible. We'll put an asterisk there. That'll tell us we're going to search for all the forms 86 times that's in the Bible. Let's, um, let's see here. There's a verse I'm looking for. I know it's in the Psalms, so let's do this, all right? Let's go to, here we go, Psalm 11, verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And then it says the Lord is in his holy temple. So it, it, I think it connects both of them there. Uh, let's see here. There's another one there. If the foundations be destroyed. Um, let's see here. Psalm 87, 1, his foundation is in the holy mountains. Psalm 102, 25, of old thou hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heaven are the work of thy hands. Uh, Psalm 104, who laid the foundations of the earth? That's a good question. That it should not be removed forever. Is there such a thing as an unmovable foundation? Absolutely. Uh, here we go. Right, Proverbs 10, 25. Um, as the whirlwind passeth, so is the wicked no more. But the righteous is an what? An everlasting foundation. And I believe that. I believe that there are some things that are absolutely immutable, immovable, totally everlasting. And one of those is the right foundation. What is the foundation of your church? What is the foundation of your marriage? What is the foundation of your worldview? What is the foundation of um, raising children? And just, you know, just ask these questions. But there is a, uh, I was doing this study, and I've got a lot of verses here. 
But think of think of the church. Think of, uh, and when I say church, I'm talking about what the Bible talks about. The church is every man, woman, and child who has been born again by the Spirit of the living God, bought with the blood, sealed with the earnest of the Spirit, awaiting the glory that shall come, looking for the glorious appearing of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's who I'm talking about, because that's us. You and I, those of you living in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, even Alaska, Australia, Kenya, if you are born again, you are saved by the blood, sealed with the Holy Spirit, you are a member of the body of Jesus Christ. What is the foundation of the church built upon? Let me give you a number. This one is really, really interesting. It's a simple number, but it, it, as I was doing this study, it keeps popping up, it, this number, like forms of this number. And that's the number two. And I want you to think about what the number two means. We go to Genesis chapter two, and we have a man, and he is divided, and God takes what's from him and turns it into a woman. God, God did not pull the woman out of Adam. There's a, there's a doctrine, there's a ridiculous theory that says when God made Adam, he made him a he, she, just like God is. That's a lie, by the way. It's a setup. It's a, um, it's a conspiracy. And it's not true. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that God was a he, she, and it doesn't say that Adam was a he, she, and then God took the she out of the he, she. That's not what it says. God removed a rib out of Adam and formed the woman and brought her unto the man, and the two became one. It has to do with unity. It has, that's what it has to do with. It has to do with um, division. God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And he called the light day, and the darkness he called night. In the, in the evening and the morning were the first day. See that phrase, evening and morning, that's in Genesis? That shows you division, evening and morning. And they are, boy, I'm going to use this term, people's going to be mad. They're rightly divided, aren't they? And God did it, right? God rightly divided light from darkness, good from evil, yin from yang, all right? That, but God, God is the one who did it. Uh, the number two is also a number. Let's do this. Let's go back to the software. Let's, um, and maybe, maybe this will help some of you who uh, have been harassed by, we're going to, we should have swept that. We need to sweep it. I always like to start with a clean slate. C-O-M-M-A-N-D-M-E-N-T, and we'll do an asterisk. The word commandment or commandments 348 times, but let's just look in the New Testament, Okay. They asked Jesus, what is the greatest of the commandments? Do you remember that? And uh, let's see here. Okay, right here. Let's go here. Matthew chapter 22, verse 38. Because they asked Jesus, um, let's go to verse 34. Let's walk circumspectly around the verse in question, because that's what the Bible tells us to do. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asking him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second, see that number? The second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself on these Two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I, I love this. I absolutely love I, I was asking God, God, show me that. Show me what that means. This, these two hang all the law and prophets. When you ask God, God will just say, Mike, take a look at it. It's right there in the scriptures. God remind. oh, this is, a, I don't know if I can do this justice or not because it's kind of new. 
What did he mean? That uh, and by the way, let me let me back up a little bit here. Because the Hebrew roots people, the Seventh Day people, the um, the sacred name people, all kinds of other people, will try to convince you that in order to be a real Christian, you have to go backward and keep Torah, which that word is not in the Bible anywhere. But you have to go back and keep all the laws in the Bible. And, and they love to quote this saying, as, as I have kept my Father's commandments, so you must keep my commandments. And they say, see, Jesus said keep the commandments. Here's what Jesus said. As I have kept my Father's commandments, which means that Jesus kept the law perfectly. He obeyed it in every way. He fulfilled it in every way. Jesus now has not ten, two commandments for us. Two, see, the Ten Commandments were the old covenant laws that God made with Israel and said, if you keep the ten, I'll let you live in the land. In the new covenant, a covenant delivered to us not by an earthly mediator, but by a heavenly mediator. In the new covenant, the heavenly mediator between us and God tells us, I have already kept all of my Father's commandments. Now I'm giving you two commandments to keep. Number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. By the way, that new commandment Jesus told us, it's actually it's there, isn't it? Deuteronomy 6. Then the second one is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And if you were to look at the Ten Commandments, Commandments number 1, 2, 3, 4, and let's see, 5. 5 is sort of transitional. The first half of them deal with obeying God and honoring God. The second one has to do with our neighbor. Don't lust after your neighbor's wife. Don't steal your neighbor's stuff. Don't bear false witness against thy neighbor. Don't murder your neighbor. And so Jesus said these two commandments. Now, this is the New Covenant law, the New Testament law. It has very little to do with what we have the ability to do as far as keeping the Old Testament law. It's actually based upon a feeling, an emotion, a desire, love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. Now I'm going to show you what that looks like. I'm going to show you the example that God showed us in the Scriptures. Do you remember when Moses, uh, let me, let's look this one up here. There was Aaron and a fellow by the name of Hur, H-U-R. Uh-oh, we got to look in the Old Testament for that one. There we go. In Exodus chapter 17, um, the Israelites were fighting with the Amalekites. And Moses went up on top of a mountain, and he took, had his rod in his hand, and when he raised his hands to heaven, the Israelites prevailed against the Amalekites. But here's, and by the way, when I raise my hands to heaven, what am I doing? How, what, do you see a number here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Here's the Ten Commandments right here. But Moses, as with you and I, cannot hold his hands up for very long. You know why? Because this is like our flesh, it's weak. And God made us subject to gravity. And the law is weak in that it cannot save a person. The law cannot transform someone's life. The law is weak, and Moses couldn't keep his hands up. And when his hands went down, the Amalekites began to prevail over Joshua and the Israelites. But when Moses would kind of get his strength back, and he would hold his hands up again, and the Israelites would prevail. But then it would happen. You remember what we were talking about cycles? There are days 
when my hands are up in the sky, I'm lifting up holy hands toward the Lord, and I'm just worshiping God. God, I love your law. I love your commandments. God, you've given me a good day today. Boy, I tell you what, I just, I love your law. But then you get weak. And you just can't hold it up anymore. And there are days when the Amalekites prevail over us. If we're going to be honest, that's what we would admit. At least, if you don't want to admit it to your wife or your husband or your children or your church or what, if you don't want to put it on Facebook, don't. But at least be honest with yourself that there are days when you just can't hold those ten up very high and the Amalekites, they just kind of walk all over you, don't you? But then, you know, you kind of regain your strength. Oh, yes, the Ten Commandments. I love God's law, and I'm keeping God's law. And then you get weak again. I can't do this. So what happened? Hey, Aaron, you and her come up here. No, not her. Her. Not that. Let that girl alone. Bring her up here. No, H-U-R, Aaron. Get up here. You know what I'm talking about. Quit playing with me. So Aaron and her walk up there, and they set Moses down upon a rock. I love that. And Aaron won, and her, two, take Moses' hands and hold them up for him. So now all the law is hanging on the two. Isn't that cool? Isn't that neat? We have two laws. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two laws. These are the two things that the church is built upon. This is the foundation of everything that we believe, everything that we teach, everything that we are supposed to do as God's people on this earth it's the two. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I keep mentioning this number two because I'm going to start reading some scriptures about the foundation of the temple. And I want you to listen to this. In fact, take your Bible. Turn to Ezra chapter 3, all right? Ezra chapter 3. When we read this, you're going to see a bunch of twos in here. Now, Ezra is about rebuilding the house of God, the temple, Think about that. Think about Christ coming to reign in Jerusalem for 1,000 years, and he's going to dwell in a temple not made with hands. I don't know what you think about the, 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 the temple of Christ's second coming, but if you think that it's built by the Rockefellers, or you think it's built by the Southern Baptists, or you think it's built by the Independent Baptists, you think it's built by human hands, out of human materials, you're wrong. It's not. God won't dwell in it. He dwells, he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Christ, like Moses, pitches his own tabernacle. Just think about that. So this is about the rebuilding of the temple in the last days. This is a prophecy here in Ezra chapter 3. Listen to this. Now you'll see this number 2 here. And, you're going, and there's some other things you're going to see in this that you're going to go, oh, that's pretty cool. Never thought of it that way. Watch this now. Ezra chapter 3, verse 6. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. Think of the foundation. Now in verse 8. Now in the second year of their coming into the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month, began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they that were come out of captivity into Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward. Are you seeing this so far? We have the second year that they came back from captivity. In the second month, now they're going to pick everybody from the Levites 20 years old and upward. See that number two there? By the way, think of this. Think of 
the third day, prophecy. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, we will live together in his sight. That's Hosea chapter 6. So think of this number two being associated with the times of the Gentiles. The, uh, um, Joseph, when Joseph is um, rejected by his brethren, he then goes on to be the second in command of basically the entire world. And he marries a Gentile wife and has how many sons? Two. Manasseh and Ephraim. Think of, um, well, there's, there's a, a, think of this. When the Israelites are going to go through Jericho into the promised land, this is in the book of Joshua. Joshua is going to lead them into the promised land. They're going to cross the Jericho, oh, excuse me, the Jordan River, Jericho River. <laughs> what is wrong? Let's see, I need a, there we go. They're going to cross the Jordan River. God said, we're going to send the Ark of the Covenant first, but don't go yet. The Ark of the Covenant is going to be 2,000 cubits ahead of you. So then, first, the Ark of the Covenant goes in. Then 2,000 things later, Israel comes in. Isn't that neat? I love that. It's the two days of the church age, the 2,000 years. It's the time when the two commandments rule over God's kingdom. Love the Lord with all your heart and all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. So think about this. From 20 years old and upward, uh, there's to set forward the work of the house. So we're back in uh, Ezra chapter 3. Um, let's see here. Look at verse 9. Then stood Jeshua with his sons and, and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah together, to set forward the workmen of the house, the sons of Hinnadad with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. Now look at verse 10. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple, think of something in the New Testament that talks about laying a foundation because these things are going to click. This, there's a mate to Ezra chapter 3 in another place in the Bible. None shall want her mate, the Bible says. So they laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord. They set the priests in their apparel with trumpets. Can you think of anything in the Bible in the New Testament that has to do with trumpets. Think about, for the uh, Lord sh shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. Uh, Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, we should not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Here we have, they're going to lay the foundation of the temple, and when they do, they're going to blow the trumpets. I love this. And the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course and praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people did what? Look at that. Look at, look at your Bibles. Look at this, and all the people shouted with a great shout. I need to, uh, here, I need to do this. Let me click this. Here we go. And all the people shouted with a great shout. What are we listening for? What's going to happen? The Lord shall, shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the sounding of the trumpets. That's what Ezra chapter 3 is pointing you to. It's pointing you to the time when the foundation of the house of the Lord is, the foundation has to be laid first. Then the building is going to be set on top of the foundation. Christ is going to build his temple on a foundation that has already been laid. Think of that. I'm just I'm quoting New Testament, man. We're going to get to it in a little bit. So they shouted with a great shout, and when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and the Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of, his, of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy. By the way, this was the second temple. Isn't that beautiful? Because the first one was destroyed. Think of, uh, think of Christ. His first coming, he said what? Destroy this temple. 
And in three days, after two, in three days, I'll rebuild it. It's about the second coming. Mm -mm -mm. Anyway, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, they wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard. Look at those last two words there, afar off. You know what that means? The phrase afar off. Study this in your Bible. Write this down and study it. Afar off, and right next to it, the future. In Genesis 22, Abraham saw the place afar off. Heck, you know what? It's my show. I can do whatever I want to. Afar off. Let me, um, let me do this and show you this. Look at this. The phrase afar off. 48 times. Look at this. Look what Peter said about it. Where is what Peter said? Here we go. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see what? Afar off. That means you cannot see into the future. You can't see what Abraham saw, Mount Moriah. You can't see things afar off. Just study that phrase. Are there people who are blind to what's going to happen in the last days? Oh, yeah, they are. And you know why they are? They won't study the Scriptures for their answers. They'll just read somebody else's books. They'll read the, the Well, the prophecy experts are telling us this is how it's going to be. Who cares? I know a guy. I know a guy who's a prophecy expert. His name is Paul. I know I read another guy, too, called um, Isaiah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Oh, yeah, read Isaiah. I don't think I'll ever get his autograph in the book, but, I mean, I read Isaiah. Read your scriptures, people. Anyway, uh, so th what is teaching you there, this number two here, this is the second temple. It's this, like the second coming of Christ. The foundation is being laid right now in the two days from the time Christ came the first time to the time he comes the second time. The foundation is being laid. Zechariah chapter 4, turn there. You're going to like this. Oh, you're going to like this. Whew. Some of you are going to like it. Some of you are going, Hoggard's an idiot! Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. You know what the word of the Lord is? It's your King James Bible. This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. You've heard that phrase, right? Not by might, but not by power. What is that in relation to? It's in relation to the building of the foundation of the Lord and building his temple, building his house. It's not done by might and by power. Not how these Egyptian giants built these pagan temples called the Great Pyramids. That was by might and by power. God is going to build his temple by the Spirit. Anyway, keep reading. This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O mountain, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings. There it is again shoutings. He's going to bring the headstone. You know what that is? That is Christ, the chief corner stone. By the way, it is not the cap stone on top of the unfinished pyramid. That is antichrist. And anybody who says it is, is a liar. Christ is not the capstone. That's what the NIV calls him. That's what um, Clarence Larkin changed the King James Bible. He didn't like what it said. 
So he changed it. He changed chief cornerstone to capstone. That's what he said. You don't believe me? Go, go, go. You can get online, get a free copy of Dispensational Truth. He's got a whole section in there about how the pyramid is Jesus Christ. And the capstone with the all-seeing eye on it, that's, that's really Jesus. Because really the Bible should have said capstone. Not chief cornerstone of the foundation. Let me keep reading here. He shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying. Look at that word there, and notice how many times it's mentioned. Grace, grace. Unto it. The headstone is going to come shouting, grace, grace. Now, there's some people out there, and I love you. I really do. There are people out there who are trying to tell me and others that when God restores Israel, he's going to make them keep the laws. And they're going to, if the, if the Israelite of the last day has any chance at all in going to heaven, they're going to have to maintain their salvation by works. And they also teach that Peter, the apostle to the Jews, had a completely different gospel, so-called, to the Israelites. Now, us Gentiles, we get grace. We don't have to do anything for our salvation. Israel does. That's what they say. They say that the gospel that Peter preached is works, do works, keep all the commandments, do good deeds, and earn your salvation. But you can't have it by grace. But that's not what Zechariah said. And that's not what Jesus said. The headstone is going to come forth, and he's going to be shouting, grace, grace. Keep reading. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands also shall finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. Who is it? Who is it that John saw that had seven eyes? It's Jesus, wasn't it? He had seven eyes. They're the seven spirits of God. I love this. Now let's look at what the New Testament says. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. Um, I have a note. I was reading my note here. Zerubbabel is a type of Christ who lays the foundation, then builds the temple with his own hands. And I submit to you, we're going to see this in the Scriptures, that Christ is laying the foundation right now in the two days or the 2,000 years of this Gentile church age with the two laws. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, Love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two commandments that you and I are under. Think about it. Okay? Now watch this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, number one. Right here, already, we're seeing that Christ is the foundation head stone, not the cap stone. He is the part of the foundation of God's church, of God's believers, his body of believers. Christ is the chief corner stone of the foundation. Ephesians 2.20, 
and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner stone. Not the capstone at the top of the pyramid. The cornerstone of the foundation. Now, think about this. Think about, uh, well, let me, let me quote the scripture here. Revelation 21, 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, Here's another one that you're not going to, some of you are not going to like. Some of you just love the Word of God. You love the Word of God, and when I quote scriptures like this, you're going, amen. That's the Word of God, man. Some of you don't like this because you've got, you've been told, you've been told what to think. You've been told that if you don't think our way, you're not saved. You've been told that if you don't believe our eschatology, you're not saved. You cannot be part of us. Get out of here. We don't want you around. That's what you've been told. You've been told that the Gentile church is only established upon the writings of the Apostle Paul. That's what you've been told. You've been told to ignore the four Gospels, Hebrews, James, First and Second Peter, uh, First, Second, Third John, Revelation. You've been told to ignore those. You've been told that the church only listens to the Apostle Paul. That all of our doctrine can only come from the Apostle Paul. Now, that's wrong in so many ways, but I'll give you a few examples of why that's wrong. First Corinthians, take your Bibles, open her up. I'll be using the King James Version for this one. First Corinthians, chapter 1, uh, and then I'll read this verse I just read earlier. Uh, Paul, I mean, Paul came right out of the chute on these Corinthians. I mean, he kind of was talking nice for a little bit in the first chapter, but then he went after them. He said, um, It hath been declared unto me, verse 11, of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. In other words, contend means to fight. And I can tell you, I've been in church nearly all of my life, and I can tell you, it's, it's a, I, I know some people like this. They're just not happy unless there's a big fight going on. I have been in church. I have seen, a church, I've seen this church split when I, was a, when I was a young teenager. Tore me up inside. I, respect, I, I idolize the people of this church, the grown-ups here. And I had to sit and watch them fighting one another. And it wasn't over doctrine. It wasn't over we had a bad, a liberal preacher. It was over who was going to run the board of the church. That's what it was all about. And it was a couple Jezebel women that we had at the time, too. And I watched this church split right in half. And I, I loved these people. During, that, during one of the board meetings, one of the church business meetings, one of the Jezebel women got up. One of the most godly men that I've ever known in my life, a deacon at this church, Brother Dale McCurry. Godly man. Loved the Bible, loved, loved and was standing up for the pastor. In meekness, this Jezebel woman got up, walked over to him, and slapped him in the face right in a church business meeting on a Wednesday night. There have been fights in churches ever since there was a church. God hates them. Now, I'm not saying that we just forget about what divides us and all, which all just get along now. But I am telling you, if you say you believe the King James Bible, then you run with it, and you preach this King James Bible. But the contentions that were, that were in the Corinthian church, it was not over, it was not over the, the Bible issue. 
It was not over the blood. It was not over the virgin birth of Christ. Here's what it was all about. He said, there's contentions among you. You're fighting. Um, verse 12, now this I say that every one of you saith, well, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos. I am of Cephas. You know how that is? Peter. And I of Christ. You know what he's saying? Some of you are saying, we only follow the Apostle Paul. He is our, he's the apostle to the Gentiles. We only follow him. And then others saying, no, we only follow Peter. Peter was the, he was the head there. The, the, he's the Pope. We, we only follow Peter. Some of them were going, oh, no, we follow Apollos. And then there was the real spiritual group here was saying, we're of Christ, bless God. We follow Christ. I don't like fighting. I don't like, I don't like getting into arguments. I don't normally do it. I just I avoid them at all costs. I like to come up here to my little room and talking to my camera and micro, my microphone and you sitting out there, I can't see you if you're mad at me, so just be mad at me. But Paul dealt with this issue about those who said that they were dispensed to Paul, and Paul was the only thing that built our doctrine. And Paul said, that's wrong. You, you're trying to say, well, we only follow Paul. You know, you, you have to follow Peter. You can't follow Paul. You can only follow Peter. That is unbiblical. And here it is again. We see in Ephesians 2.20, the church built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The apostles, plural, not singular. Peter did not contradict Paul doctrinally. Neither do James, neither do Revelation, neither do the four Gospels. They don't contradict one another. They complement one another. Hey, that's a nice tie you have on there. Really? I like your hair. I like how it works today. They were complimenting each other. They don't contradict one another. How can it, how can, listen to this. Listen to, listen to the words of our Savior. How can a house stand if it's divided against each other? How can the house of God stand if, as some say, these people can only be of Peter and these people can only be of Paul? How can that house stand? That foundation is divided against itself. That house will not stand. You know what? You want to get your doctrine out of the Bible? Get it out of the Bible. Get it out of Genesis. Get it out of Revelation. Get it out of the Psalms. Get it out of Isaiah. Get it out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Get it out of Hebrews, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians. Get it out of Revelation. Get your doctrine from the whole counsel of God because that's what God's house is built upon. The sure foundation of the apostles and the prophets. By the way, Included in that, the Apostles, New Testament. Prophets, Old Testament. The two. Amen. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, not the capstone. That's ignorant. Second Timothy 2.19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standing, standeth sure, having this seal. Number one, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And number two, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. See, it's got two seals, doesn't it? Isn't it cool? It's the two, the two days, the 2,000 years, the two commandments. Christ is building and laying the foundation right. And Israel doesn't get saved with a separate gospel. That's, that's wrong. Israel... And the house of Israel is going to be built on the foundation of the church age. Not put off in some works-based shifting sand gospel, but the one gospel of Jesus Christ, the one that Paul and Peter both preached. But Christ is laying the foundation right now. And when the foundation's done, there's going to be shouting and trumpets are going to sound. Wow. I love this. Hebrews chapter 6, 1. 
Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Um, we read earlier, Revelation 21, 14, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and, on, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. By, by the way, if you don't believe what I'm saying, go read Revelation 21. God drew a picture for us in our Bibles of exactly what his kingdom looks like. It, can, it doesn't just, it's, well, that's the kingdom for the Jews and the kingdom for the Gentiles, and God separates them out. And under, No, 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 no. New Jerusalem has the foundation of the church age, the apostles. But the walls that are built on it have 12 gates, and each one of them has the 12 tribes written on them. They're both included together in the one city of God, New Jerusalem. By the way, you have that, you have that picture in your body. You got 12 ribs on your right side and 12 on your left side. Think about, um, think about what side represents who. The right side is where the New Testament is. The New Testament is on the right side of your Bible. And the right side, the right hand, it's the right hand that has strength and power. Remember, the law, the law doesn't have any strength. It's on the left side. So you have 12 bones, 12 ribs, which I think are the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ on the right side. But what about the left side? I think that represents Israel. By the way, where's your heart? It's in the center, kind of but it's just slightly to the left. Where is Jesus' heart? Who was he really thinking of when he died on the cross? Who was it that Aaron, when Aaron went in as the high priest, he was to wear a shield, a breastplate. And on that breastplate was 12 stones. And on those stones was the names of each tribe of the nation of Israel. And the Bible specifically said, so that when Aaron goes in to the most holy place with the blood of atonement, that the names of the tribes of Israel are on his heart when he does his sacrifice. And I just don't understand how God would take us Gentiles who are nothing and give us what would amount to the better gospel when the fact is he's loved Israel a lot longer than he has us. In fact, if in typology language, do you know who we are? We're Leah. We're the ugly sister. Rachel was the true love, not Leah. And it just doesn't make sense to me that us Gentiles would get the better gospel and Israel, whom God really loves. They are his true love, his first love. Israel is his firstborn. Why Israel would get the lesser gospel? Why they would have to do what we don't have to. They have to work. They have to keep their salvation. They have to maintain good works, or they'll lose their salvation. And to me, it's just funny. It's, it's funny. These people say, oh, you don't, I don't believe you can lose your salvation, unless you're a Jew. There are just so many things wrong with that. Um... Let's see here. First Kings chapter 5, 17, the king commanded, and they brought great stones, costly stones, and huge stones to lay the foundation of the house. First Kings 5, 11, Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 measures of wheat for food in his household and 20 measures of pure oil. Thus gave Solomon to Hiram year by year. See the twos there? Hiram was the one who built the, the temple. Hiram's 
name is mentioned 22 times in the Bible, by the way. Um, here's the note that I had. Christ is laying the foundation of the apostles and their doctrine during the 2,000 years of the church age, after which he will build the temple of God in the last days. Mm -mm -mm. Now think of this, the wailing wall. What's the wailing wall? Does anybody know? It's the last surviving remnant of the foundation of the old temple. Guess what is going to happen to that wall? Go to Matthew 24. Because your Savior told you what was going to happen to it. Those of you who insist that you're only of Paul, then please don't turn to Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, Jesus, verse 1, Jesus went out and departed from the temple. You see that? Why is those words in your Bible? When Jesus left, when he departed the temple, you know what he was showing? I'm, I'm done with Israel. Paul did the same thing. Paul kept preaching to those Jews, and all they did was laugh at him and try to have him killed and mock him. And there came a point, Paul, every place he would go, he'd go to the synagogues first, preach the gospel, preach the gospel, preach the gospel. They weren't hearing it. They didn't want nothing to do with it. And finally, Paul said, I'm done. I'm done. I will not ever again preach the gospel in these synagogues. I will not go to you Jews anymore. I'm going, I'm going to the highways and the hedges, and I'm going to compel all who would to come in to the marriage feast. Because the people that were first invited, well, they had too many other important things to do. So Paul said, I'm not going to preach to them anymore. I'm done. So Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said, the buildings, plural, not just the main temple itself, but the whole compound. Jesus said unto them, see not all these things, all these things, every one of them? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So our preterist people, and they're eh, millennial people. Maybe I ought to say it like this, millennial. Doesn't that kind of work? Millennial. I like it, okay? I like that. That's, that's pretty good. So our preterist friends and our millennial people say, well, in AD 70, this was fulfilled, so it's over with. It's done. Keep on moving. There's nothing left to see here in Matthew 24. Keep moving right along. It wasn't all fulfilled. It wasn't all done in A.D. 70. They forgot a wall. It's still there. It's part of the foundation. And it hasn't been destroyed yet. But it's going to be. Those stones are coming down. And they have to because he taketh away the first that he may establish the second. That's in Hebrews. And those of you who are only of Paul, don't go read Hebrews 10, all right? Don't go do that. The rest of you, read Hebrews chapter 10. Been good to be with you today. Had a little fun, maybe at your expense. That's okay. You have fun at mine as well. I love you. We will see you on next Tiwi's Day. Sunday morning, uh, Sunday school, Sunday a.m. service, Sunday night. Um, Watchman video broadcast. I haven't recorded it yet. I'm going to come in tomorrow do it. The number 13, the Great Seal. All right. We'll see you later, Allie. It's good to be back. Thanks for praying for me. Continue to pray for uh, Dee and her family and pray for Sister Waymeyer. Pray for her family. All right. God bless you. We'll see you.